So welcome, Christina. Um, she's talking about uh, road safety, if I'm mm -hmm. not mistaken. Road safety, not roadblocks, but um, uh, traffic safety. Yeah, um, yeah so uh, I'll, I'll just get started. Um, While well, this is slowly coming on, it might be quite mesmerizing to look at the, to look at the moving images. Um, so I'm going to talk about navigating the um, yeah, obstacles of working with local government, um, especially when trying to answer really hard questions um, with using um, open data. I'm uh, going to share a project from the United States, um, from Washington, D.C., that um, we've been working on. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're going to look more closely at that in a minute. I'll, I'll have some more general examples of like what, what we do um, um, before from other cities around the globe. We is, um, I'm Christina Franken. Um, you can guess my accent later. Um, I think uh, the, um, the uh, question is like, who here knows Mapbox? I guess some people do. Uh, Mapbox is a um, technology com company, a location platform for developers. So it's yeah, mostly developers now. <laughs> um, the project I'm here to introduce is or share about is um, Mapbox Cities. It's a uh, program where we work with cities specifically. Uh, and um, next to data analysis and um, kind of working with open data in these cities uh, to answer really um, kind of uh, ur big urban challenges. We're uh, looking or researching specifically like how um, new technologies like augmented reality uh, change the way that um, consumers and um, ultimately citizens engage with the data layer a city has. So let's dive straight in. Um, essentially what we're doing is um, turning this, which is a very common site on uh, open data portals around the globe. This is an example of a very attractive spreadsheet at the city of Melbourne in um, Australia. Uh, we're turning this, uh, or we're helping Melbourne to turn this um, into this. Um, essentially, for as a kind of public front end for a data uh, for a, a massive open data um, set, this is much more attractive for most um, kind of members of the local community. Essentially, this is the uh, building application uh, spreadsheet that we've seen before, turned into a 3D interactive model of the city, really showing how Melbourne um, is right now in 3D and then how it's going to change over time when all these new um, development activities um, have been you know, uh, completed. So I'm not sure if I mentioned it, but Mapbox is an open source company. So it's um, a really uh, a big part of the program that we uh, work with cities to better understand the potential of open source. And um, this is a very interesting study that just only recently was um, uh, published by uh, the World Bank. Uh, it's essentially showing how the uh, organizations that um, kind of invest into open source uh, can expect an increased um, uh, return on investment um, compared to traditionally closed by default software in investments. So yeah, ideally um, our big picture is that um, is, is to build a toolbox of, uh, of solutions uh, for cities to pick from rather than having to you know build from scratch every time. Uh, this the example from just now from Belgium uh, was like let's fix my street. It would be like uh, why can you not just all use the same kind of tool and uh, or even connect the databases rather than like I'm kind of keeping it separate. Um, um, and that obviously happens all around the globe and a lot of urban issues are very similar. Um, so ideally like with using open source tools and open source co code bases we could like you know kind of get into the really important issues rather than like getting stuck at like showing some kind of bits of data on a map or, uh, for different cities and diff different times. Uh, so yeah, let's, uh, yeah, let's dive straight into this. Um, so yeah, that's how it could, could be. It could be like, um, uh, like just a visualization of schools in this case, but it could be a visualization of anything else. And the, the code is, um, uh, is open source and um, any city can kind of use it and repurpose it for whatever they need. This is a very common example at the moment in the US, they're just discovering cycling. I know this is not so exciting over here, but uh, kind of this whole bike share thing is, um, is huge and there's so many different providers and that was like one of the first ones that the DC government actually made um, available on GitHub to kind of just copy for other cities to reuse. So I mentioned earlier, I think the, the example I'm talking about is traffic safety or, or traffic road, road, road issues. Um, I think um, it's hard for us to imagine how, how different this is in the, in the United States. Um, the whole thing started with um, 
when 2015, the numbers for, um, of traffic fatalities were announced and it was uh, suddenly 7.2% higher than the year before. That's quite a jump, and that also made uh, the public aware of what, what, what was going on in, uh, on the roads. This is like a big number for obviously also a very big country, but um, I'm gonna have some comparison later. There's a lot of Vision Zero um, uh, initiatives that um, started after this, but then actually 2016, um, the number still continues to rise, and that um, is, uh, we're currently waiting for the 2017 numbers. It's expected to be around 40K of people actually dying in traffic, not just accidents. And that means, like, um, to put this in perspective, it's this kind of roughly the same category of size as, like, um, breast cancer or colon cancer. And that's kind of really shocking for a, you know, like, developed country. Um, uh, I'm not going to go into the craziness of, of, of people driving in the US, but what I, I want to show is, like, um, <laughs> I could, but I won't. Um, uh, what I want to show is like the first, the, how Mapbox got, or how we got into this as, as Mapbox Cities, we were asked to visualize this um, first big number from 2015, um, and um, the team working on that, and I can't really take the, um, the, the price here, it's like, it's, it's kind of a really good way of um, kind of looking at the data, because it is like, um, it's about like obviously informing the public what could happen to them and understanding what has happened in the past. So they ask people rather than looking at all the data and exploring by country or by county or a, a city, they ask them to put in their daily commute route and then explore the data that happened on the route that they know from every day, like getting to work and home, right? Um, so that's the first way of us getting in into this um, kind of yeah subject. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure who knows who's from here is familiar with Vision Zero. It's a yeah, it's a Swedish concept. Um, um, the ironic thing is that Sweden does it, it's not that popular or important here in in Europe. Um, obviously, the impact that can be made in a city like um, Los Angeles with like 244 people kind of death uh, dying from traffic, uh, from just being on the road, mainly like pedestrians and cyclists, is um, is very different. And this is a number for LA, and then compared to Amsterdam, that's unfortunately. It's not very easy to find these numbers. It's about 15 people. Um, obviously, LA is much bigger than um, Amsterdam, but I would assume that there's a very si similar or even more cyclists and pedestrians on the roads in Amsterdam than there is in LA. Um, so, you know, like I don't want to say this is like scientifically to compare, but I think it's just showing the kind of the sizes of what we're talking about. Essentially, um, um, cities like LA and um, and, and DC, uh, Washington DC are trying to reduce their um, number of traffic deaths to zero in a given time frame. Um, um, yeah, so Vision Zero in DC started actually in 2015, a bit ahead of the curve. They want to reduce their traffic uh, fatalities by 2025 to zero. Um, yeah, it's run by the department, the District Department of Transport, so DDOT, I'm going to maybe mention this abbreviation a few more times <laughs> today. Essentially, that's the people we started talking with after they found, uh, saw the other visualization that we've done and they were quite in interested in like doing something something with the data. The reason is that um, their, one of their three main goals was, uh, or is, for Vision Zero, is to um, kind of make this a very data-driven campaign and um, um, use insights from data to um, prioritize uh, and ideally justify measures that have been taken on the roads of the, of the city. This is important since um, the local media is quite active and they often um, call to justify or explain why certain decisions have been made, especially in the light of um, equality and like um, uh, kind of unprejudiced um, kind of decision making uh, by the local government. I'm not sure, has anybody here already uh, ever been to Washington DC? Essentially, it's an interesting, it's an interesting place because um, when you get there, all you see is like a very nice, very clean, very wide, very American city. Um, a lot of green space, um, a lot of um, you know, open water, and like uh, just a lot of government buildings, of course. Um, but um, there is much more to it. So um, this is a map by my colleague Eric Fisher. He um, looked at um, the US uh, 2010 census data, and every dot on this map represents 25 um, um, residents. Uh, red is for white, blue is for black neighborhoods, uh, or black uh, um, kind of uh, 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 racial um, areas. Green is for Asian and orange Hispanic. And so you obviously don't see many of those. <coughs> and yellow is um, is um, is also for others. 
Um, so this kind of explains how the city is kind of um, kind of mixed or not mixed um, by um, this uh, this extreme uh, these two extreme kind of um, racial um, uh, kind of yeah. Uh, yeah, this out, yeah, it's it's kind of really shocking if you think about it because all we know of the sea is often like the very white and very central neighborhoods, and um, that but that explains as well that when um, the government spends money on a campaign like Vision Zero, that that, that they are asking for like um, pro to prove how that um, those decisions that um, kind of govern the um, the uh, action measures on the roads have been made and if they've been made um, like um, kind of with quality in mind. Um, Yeah, so the main goal for um, using data um, in this, um, in this uh, campaign is to act faster and act fair. But ideally, DDOT would act, make decisions um, continuously as the data um, uh, kind of is collected and is, um, is, uh, <coughs> is being updated. The problem is that if it takes you know, almost forever to make the data um, public, then um, how long is it going to take to actually make uh, create make policy from this, and how long is it going to take to make um, action happen in the streets? Um, so that's it's interesting. But let's um, kind of dive a bit uh, further in how this project um, unfolded. So it really started in December 2016 uh, after the kind of first first map um, um, we published. But then the real like there's all sorts of other things happening that delayed it, and I'm going to kind of kind of come back to this a bit later. Well, we kicked off with an in-person meeting in August and um, had the external deadline to finish and present this project um, during Smart Cities Week DC last year in October. So the whole project happened in three months. Um, because until the meeting in DC in August, I could not get um, uh, the, the government um, kind of people on, on in this project, the, the DDOT, to focus on um, getting us a real research question or like a the main question that they wanted us to answer with all the data that we tried to explore. Um, there was all sorts of destruction before that, but that's also fine. So let's get uh, take a look at this data. On the left is a screenshot from just now, so the data set is of course much, much bigger, and um, on the right is like how it roughly looked um, mid last year. It was about 150,000 entries and 45 um, attributes. It's quite a huge um, kind of um, spreadsheet. Um, essentially, the biggest issue was the data quality. It was very poor. There was a lot of um, kind of missing values or um, things just didn't make sense. Honestly, like if you download it and you already have a direct connection with the government, you're like, oh, what? Is, I really thought all the time it's my. I, I'm just like not good enough in Python, and I just like make all these like weird beginners mistakes. But actually, it was like the quality was so bad, and um, they had a great idea mid um, like throughout the process, like halfway like July or something, they <coughs> decided to split the data into two um, spread basically massive data sets because they wanted to split some of the attributes up into like the difference between cycling, uh, uh, cycling. Um, uh, walking uh, pedestrians and um, and um, and uh, uh, kind of vehicle um, um, uh, injuries and all that, but um, that only uh, made it impossible to merge those two different uh, separate data sets back together. Um, so it yeah it was just a, it was almost comical. I yeah I think I should like kind of present it in much more fun in a much more fun way. But uh, essentially like it was really like they could not they did not believe me that I that there was not one attribute that had only unique values, so I could not merge those two data sets back together. And we had a few people like looking over it and, and actually kind of presenting it to them. And they still, I think they still haven't found the, the, the errors. Because the problem is not that they don't have, the data is so bad on their service, on their end, the data only gets bad by the time it actually goes through all the processes that are needed and the IT teams and different departments that actually put it onto the open data model in the, in the end. Um, so yeah, that was a bit of a challenge, but we kind of worked around it, and essentially we used the very uh, like a 2016 data set for the for the bigger analysis and um, kind of data model. So the first step for us was visualizing it. Mapbox is a is a mapping platform, so we visualized it. I mean, I think it's not very kind of actually see it very well, but um, essentially like putting all the different dots on the map was is, is one thing. We aggregated it to census tracts and set census blocks to give. A better um, idea of like how this is spread around the city, and then uh, what's turned on here is this high, uh, show high risk intersections, and that's actually the, uh, the the actual like work we've done is is bringing a lot of different data sets that were relevant 
for this into a scientific um, kind of collision frequency model to explore like and actually prioritize the intersections based on the frequency of crushes that have been happening there in the, over the past years in the data that we have available. So we work with the assumption if there is more vehicles and more pedestrians, there must be more opportunities for incidents. Another assumption, and I think that's very common, um, if, there are pe if people tend to drive faster in an area, then there must be more crashes happening. Uh, and another one was um, if there's more shops, uh, restaurants, like economic or business activity, uh, or maybe also schools, then that also influences the frequency of um, crashes in this neighborhood. The data we use was from the open data portal, is the crash data I just mentioned that they were very, uh, still are very proud of, um, uh, and they should be, but it's just very frustrating, the amount of time I spent on that, on that, on that, on that um, uh, data set. Um, the sen like the 2010 census data and intersection data, then we um, looked at the Howard University Traffic Data Center um, because the somehow DDOT, um, it, they give all that their traffic data, traffic counts to the uh, university traffic center, but they don't somehow have maintained their own version of it anymore. The traffic data center essentially analyzes and visualizes it on a map, and that's you know online. So we could not get these traffic counts, which we needed in order to normalize the the crash crash uh, data. Um, we had to like scrape the website. They just could not explain it themselves either. It's quite um, comical. Um, and um, so, like, and lastly, what I uh, the the speeds um, uh, in order to explore like um, areas where people tend to drive faster. I have to mention that um, in the U.S. there is no uniform like inner city speed limits. Um, it means that any city can any city any road in a city can have a different speed limit based on the traffic si uh, signs they have. Ironically, again, they don't have that data available as open data, so um, and the, the, it was just a signed inventory that they may have been able to publish, but they were too slow to do it for the short time frame that we set for this project. So we ended up using proprietary mobile sensor data that we use for our navigation products and kind of extracted like areas where people tend to drive faster than the average um, of the city, just to make a, a roughly informed decision. But um, ideally, we would. The, the DDoT would, you know, get faster in publishing the data that they have in, internally for the, on their systems. So the um, collision frequency model um, kind of looked at the uh, crash data in relation to several other um, uh, data sets that we had had available, and looked at what are the conditions under which there is more than usual uh, more crashes than usual happening. <coughs> So the outcome was that um, clearly lively urban DDOT uh, will use to prioritize measures uh, across the city for to improve traffic safety uh, for pedestrians and cyclists this year. The outcome for this, um, well, we got a featured in, in the in the Washington Post that was kind of a big deal apparently when when you are in DC. I didn't know. It was um, kind of funny, um, but um, the in, in general, like for a company like Mapbox, we have a, have a, we we started the company started in, in DC, and we have had uh, some form of relationship with the city, but um, it's been um, uh, intensified since, which is good, and we've have been speaking with more departments, and. Um, actually just got a new office there. So it's kind of good to um, kind of do something like this. Obviously, we're in a special situation where we don't have to uh, win the, uh, the city as a, as a, as a customer. But um, it's been uh, certainly an interesting way to get our foot in the door. And I think uh, that could help, uh, could, could work for other strategies as well. I mentioned that I'm going to come back to this. Um, why did it take so long? Uh, one thing was that um, we were like sending um, agreements back and forth because we weren't sure at the beginning, like what kinds of data we would um, look at and uh, what types of data we would exchange. Um, essentially, when we kind of agreed that we would only look at open data for now, uh, it was okay to just go without an <coughs> agreement. And the other thing is there were some data sets that the uh, DDoS GIS people were very proud of. They really wanted us to use them, but we just like, it was, did not make any sense without like having a real like research kind of question and structure in order to approach this whole thing. And so it, we, we wasted a lot of time like kind of trying to understand like 
um, complex like road uh, center line like um, system that they had built with like 14 um, kind of aspects of every on uh, alongside every road to really exactly identify the width of every bike lane and we're just like this was just you know like o o o um, information overload very early on and that's what really kind of caused it to delay the whole project um, we got a lot of like um, kind of speaking um, engagement afterwards and are still doing it um, but I think we're at this point now where we like um, want to make sure that we've gotten our takeaways from this and uh, kind of make a, you know make uh, kind of think about what, what the next steps are um, there was a huge team involved and I'm lucky that uh, Mapbox is uh, so diverse and um, has, has you know offices in Bangalore so Washington DC San Francisco we work with a, a research fellow in London the final team is uh, like uh, with some some uh, very um, passionate people around open data uh, with Eric Fisher and Morgan um, who both maintain their own projects so it's really important to have that uh, in place the project is currently like still uh, kind of a private repo at Mapbox but we're working on like um, making it open um, so we can hopefully soon um, talk about like sharing the data set as um, not only the data set but the tool and the um, uh, kind of d the code that went into the model to um, use it in other cities around the globe so yeah as I mentioned takeaways so one thing I would like to say and I mentioned it earlier in a conversation as well like um, show don't just tell so it's just like it's very easy for us um, like I mean I'm somehow in between so I don't I'm not like totally like Geeky, um, but um, it's very easy to, when you talk with government that you s use the wrong wording or you um, use like terms that are very, you know, known to you, but it's very difficult for them to understand. And the same goes for like visualizing things. Like um, if I think of, uh, for me, the building, uh, the data set uh, from Melbourne that I showed in the beginning, it is very like I can see it already, but um, not everybody can see it when you see a spreadsheet like that. So I think it's very important to just prototype and like make a mock-up. Um, deadlines, um, yeah, I literally signed us up for the um, Smart Cities Week DC because I knew that if I get in and they like it, then I have an internal reason as well to pull the whole team along and that, that's what happened. Um, and that's what happened with lots of other conferences as well. Um, yeah, I said diverse team, but it's not so much necessary that the team is diverse as in like, um, you know, gender diversity or, or racial diversity, but I think it, everybody has to be very passionate about the cause. And I think um, that's what something what, like I really noticed is like working on traffic safety. There is always some, gonna be someone that is more passionate about this than others. And that's the end already. Um, I, yeah, if this is interesting for you, sign up for the newsletter. If you have questions, ask me now if I can, if they can. And if not, you can email me. Thank you. Why in general did Mapbox start the Mapbox Cities project? Oh, um, that's a good question. It was, um, <laughs> it was, um, why was, um, I don't think, it was not a strategic decision per se. I did some research um, in 2016, around the same time as this whole thing started, um, about um, like uh, smart cities and why cities should use data and what's the importance of open data and open source for cities. Uh, but it said, yeah, <laughs> like uh, the then White House with around Obama, they um, kind of launched this like um, fact sheet for smart cities and, and actually because we're a DC company and the White House is kind of important, um, when, they, uh, when we had the opportunity to put um, something or announce something as part of this fact sheet, they, um, I got again like the internal buy-in from everybody and I just kind of made a website and pushed it live within like three days. Honestly, and that's why like, then after that it all came together. We basically had to come up with something that is cool enough to announce in a, in a White House spreadsheet, uh, fact sheet. And we came up with the idea to like, um, launch an open call to invite three cities to work with us. And the three cities um, last year were um, Melbourne, in Australia, uh, Bloomington in Indiana is like a small university town similar to this in uh, the US. And then... Uh, 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 West Midlands, um, just north of London, um, and we had um, applications from all around the globe with 70 um, kind of applications uh, 
uh, worldwide. So that was kind of, it just, there was really a need for, the, for it, even though we still probably don't really know what we're, why we're doing it. I think there is, um, we get so much good feedback from um, both cities, but also people that work with cities um, that like, we are not trying to sell to cities. This is not a commercial thing. It's more like um, com combining the research and uh, kind of beliefs that Mapbox shares with the open data community and like um, kind of doing it rather than just talking about it, you know? Cool. Thank you. Thank you.